much. Okay, well, welcome back. I hope you're all refueled with copious amounts of coffee, which will see you through to lunchtime. Uh, our session right now is all about technology and connectivity, about innovation, uh, innovating for a sustainable Arctic future. And really, this is about, I suppose, what are the smart solutions for growth and development in the Arctic? Um, we are going to be talking about digital solutions. Um, we've already heard a little bit about the degree to which the Arctic is becoming a connected region. And the internet and our internet world is reshaping the way people relate to each other and communicate in this what was once regarded as one of the more remote and isolated parts of the world. Well, the internet breaks down those concepts of remoteness and isolation. We're also going to talk about transportation, um, major transport developments in this region which could transform shipping routes, land routes as well, and change the way in which we see the potential of this region and its economy. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we can talk about innovation, technology, infrastructure, and we're going to explore those with a panel. You can see there are lots of chairs because we've got quite a number of panelists who bring different perspectives to this. We've got politicians, we've got business people, uh, and we've got sort of local perspective as well. Let's kick off, and I would advise all my panelists, we're going to be very strict, because we've got a big panel, we're going to be very strict on your opening remarks. You've got to keep them to five minutes or less. And if you start seeing me waving my arms about, it means you've been very naughty and gone over your five minutes. And naughtiness leads to consequences, so uh, don't, don't do it. So let's... Um, start right now with our first uh, opening remarks. They come from one of our ministers here in Norway. Please give a very warm welcome to the Minister uh, for Transport and Communications in this country, Ketil Solvik Olsen. So, uh, Minister, over to you. Hello. It's uh, good to be here. And... Uh I assume I don't have to remind you about all the possibilities that you find up here in the north, with the natural resources, tourism, the know-how. My objective is to see how can we enhance all, the, all of this by having better infrastructure. We're talking both about the physical infrastructure and the digital. And to me, this, ha uh, this is about dealing with how can you also have private investments and government investment cooperate and challenge each other. When it comes to the physical infrastructure, that's usually what most of your friends and business partners are contacting me about. We need better roads, more railroads, better harbors, better airports. And yes, I do listen to that. In the past four years, we have tripled the investments in new roads. We are in the first face now also uh, reducing the backlog on when it comes to maintenance. We think that's important because it can reduce the travel time, it can increase the capacity where you need that, but the maintenance, maintenance focus deals with your transportation industry being able to predict how much time to spend getting to where they are. Especially, for instance, for the fisheries. We need to make sure that the fish get to the market as soon as possible, because that, that's the way of keeping up the value. But we also look on how can we find uh, alternatives to supplement the road infrastructure, the railroad being the main thing. We are investing more money into both, both Ufotban and Nolansban. But again, when it comes to railroad, we also need to look at the Nordic perspective and how we can connect to Europe better. That's why I'm happy to see the cooperation we have with Finland in, in that matter. And we hope to continue that and also see more than just from point to point Norway, Finland, but also see how can we can develop this down to the continent. We're looking at how we can develop the airports. The uh, fish exports from uh, Finnmark uh, via Gardermoen is one of the examples where we can retain more of the value of the fish by getting it even faster to the market. But again, 
having this happen, you need to have a lot of fish in one plane because you need to have the, uh, the economics. Seeing how you can combine then the export of goods with tourists in the plane gives more value to the uh, airlines and make them look into uh, investing more in setting up new routes. And that's also why we have to look at the facilities at some of the airports to make them better able to uh, deal with fish uh, before it gets on the plane. And we look at the uh, ocean shipping, developing uh, the harbors, some of the fishing uh, harbors, and also getting new routes developed. We have initiatives from the government for many of these uh, things I've already mentioned when it comes to investing in the airports, investing in the harbors, and we hope to see that by cooperating with the private investors that we can develop this even better. But mo a lot of the things that we're talking about also can be enhanced by looking at the technology. Digitalization of information and also how you run the operations. Within the next few years, 15 of our airports are going to be remotely controlled from Buda. That means you can open the, uh, or expand the opening hours, you can reduce the cost, making them more competitive. We're now building one of the first autonomous vessels in the world. It's going to be uh, floating the, within 2018, and by another two years, it's going to be able to be remotely controlled autonomously. Kongsberg and Yara are investing in this. We are making sure that the legal aspects of this makes it possible. The same thing comes with uh, autonomous vehicles. We had a new law enacted by the 1st of January 2018, making it possible to try out autonomous vehicles on the roads of Norway. And also there we have good cooperation with Finland on E8. If we can make that work, it can work everywhere. Also, it's fun to see that the Avinur, who runs the airports in Norway, are looking into autonomous snow removal vehicles. Again, reducing cost, increasing the opening hours. Technology makes that possible to happen. But we also have to look at the digital infrastructure. Connecting with uh, the out outside world, uh, we have new initiatives when it comes to investing in, in international fiber, but we also have more money going into safety, security for the national digital infrastructure. And I see my time is out, so I hope that's going to be part of the discussion afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and uh, many thanks for being so disciplined on the time and also for giving me an image of planes flying across Norway full of tourists and fish. Sit, sit. <laughs> I, I like the idea, but I'm not sure I want my seat next to me full of fish. But anyway, I, I think I know what you mean. Um, all right, next minister is from Finland. So a very warm welcome to Anna Berna, who is Minister of Transport and Communications in Finland. Minister, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me, and it's a great opportunity actually to follow Ketil uh, on this stage, especially since Norway and Finland have been cooperating so well, both on uh, investigating the Arctic Rail, but also on autonomous driving, on digitalization, and on developing the northern parts of uh, our countries. Finland being a small country of the edge of Europe, connectivity is everything to us. It means for us to build transportation routes via sea, land, air, and to find ways to communicate, building digital connectivity within the country and between the nations. Connectivity is also one of the priorities of the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council in 2017 to 2019. We do want to do our best to ensure that our intentions codified in the strategy are also put out into very clear actions. It's our aim to generate opportunities in all fields of society. And while doing so, we would like to make sure that we plan and coordinate these actions with all stakeholders, in particular with those who have the main experience of the Arctic area. It is our aim to bring prosperity, sustainable and economic development and social progress to Arctic inhabitants and also to all of the communities. 
Finland will continue the Arctic Council's work on telecommunications and explore the ways that we can enhance connectivity and availability of broadband services in the Arctic. This work will take into account the indigenous people, local communities and businesses, tourism and researchers. Potential communications technologies include satellite connections, mobile communication systems, low band, um, low band with transmission and sea cables. We also would like to see that we are connecting through the Arctic areas, uh, Asia with Europe and make sure that we do make data move faster than ever between those parts of the world. A concrete example of Finland that, has, that we have put forward in this matter is the Northeast Data Cable Project and building a cable project from Europe to Asia via the Northeast uh, Passage would provide an optimal solution for us for better connectivity. It means also building a bridge between Northern Europe and Asia that also brings together the area of digitalization and new business potential. In transport, digitalization and navigation will provide new opportunities for Arctic transport and safety. We also would like to see specific developments for the Arctic area in maritime navigation that also requires up-to-date awareness of ice conditions and, re and also realization of autonomous transport requires functioning satellite systems and navigation in Arctic latitudes. We think it's important that we do implement the IMO Polar Code that provides safety and environmental standards for Arctic shipping, intelligent transports where we are already collaborating with several nations. But we also would like to see that how can we develop further satellite navigation skills and opportunities. Here, we also need to push Europe as a general to make sure that we do have better access to satellite navigation data and also make sure that our competencies in this area are growing. This is the way and means where we can actually provide through autonomous systems better accessibility for both research and human activities in areas that have not been able to reach so far. We would like also to see that Arctic actions should be about operationalization of sustainable development. It is the core of a healthy development in the Arctic area and also to make sure that we are looking at the Nordic aspects as a total. There we can do more and better and also to make sure that when we are talking about developments that we always look how does it connect to the continent, how do we connect each other to other parts of the world, how can we create a better sustainable environment for our people and how do we make sure that connectivity is at the core of all of our doings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We have a, a, a triumvirate of, of ministers this morning on this panel. So without further ado, let me introduce our third minister, Karen Ellemann. She's Minister, minister of Fisheries and Equal Opportunities and Nordic Cooperation in Denmark. Minister. Thank you so much. Yes, today we do focus on connectivity, on how we connect Arctic societies to each other, but also how we connect the region to the rest of the globe. In my intervention, I will zoom in on telecommunication and why the Kingdom of Denmark attaches great importance to it as a key to economic development. And that is the end goal here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we must continue to work to secure sustainable economic development to the benefit of the four million people living here in the Arctic region. This development needs to be sustainable to ensure long-term and lasting impact. This much is also clear. And, thank and thankfully, we do have the UN Sustainable Development Goals to point to when striving to reach our shared ambition for the Arctic region. The Kingdom of Denmark contributed to this important agenda by hosting an international high-level conference 1st of December last year in Copenhagen. And the key actors underscored the um, imperative junction between the Arctic and the SDGs. They agreed that it makes sense
to let ourselves be guided by the SDGs and their environmental, social and economic dimensions, also when it comes to the development of the Arctic region. We believe that they should be the base on which we develop the new strategy for the Arctic Council. Now, regarding connectivity, off the cuff, I can only think of one situation where bad connectivity is a good thing. And that is because when I'm on a stage here speaking to a large audience, uh, where everyone more or less is checking everything on their iPhone at the same time, then a bit of disconnectivity maybe could be a helping hand. Anyway, jokes aside, and there is no discussion. I mean, we all need to be connected, and the Arctic needs to be connected. As I said before, it is the backbone of economic development. Great improvements are being made on telecommunication in the Arctic. For example, Telepost in Greenland are doing impressive work in connecting the Greenlandic people with each other and with the rest of the world. But the fact remains, in global terms, the Arctic is still a gap that needs to be closed. The diversity and distances that distinguish the region demands a range of different solutions, a sort of patchwork of solution, if you will. The good news is that there are many reasons to find and develop solutions. Consider this, which was indeed an eye-opener for me. Connecting the Arctic region to the rest of the world means enhancing global capacity to global benefit. It simply means a wider lane for data on the global scale. It means actually a stronger signal. For instance, when I'm Skyping my son on his planned study trip to New York. Even more interesting, this also means the Arctic companies can become not just local providers, but in fact also global pro providers. And this means business. This means economic development. So how do we close the gap? Through the local actors, of course. Why? Because simply put, they know what to do if an iceberg floats into the line of signal or if a sea cable is cut off by a drift anchor. Their capacity is enormous and it needs to be sustained and leveraged. We need to put to use, build and preserve the capacity already present here in the Arctic region. But local actors cannot succeed by themselves. We need private investments in order to bridge the gap. And, and this fact applies to telecommunication, but also to critical physical infrastructure, such as, for example, airports, as mentioned by my minister colleague. So um, if lots of investors are here today, I mean, please consider the huge potential in connecting the Arctic. So this is actually my main message here today. Let us partner up governments, business, and civil society and continue the important work of connecting the Arctic. But let us do so first and foremost by betting on the capacity of the Arctic businesses and people. The side effect of doing so is clear. It will create a stronger basis for the development of the Arctic region. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I must say I'm, I'm hugely impressed by the timekeeping skills of all of our ministers. Let's see if private enterprise is just as disciplined and just as good. Uh, because now um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Berit Svensson, who is the CEO of Telenor Norway. So we're going to get a private enterprise perspective uh, on this communications infrastructure uh, theme that we've got going. Over to you, Berit. Thank you, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Uh, as uh, Minister Karen Elleman was saying, digital connectivity is everything. And uh, to be honest, it is very, very hard to build out digital infrastructure in Norway because of the nature and because of the harsh weather conditions. But despite that, we are the most advanced mobile country in the world providing over 60 megabit per second on average to the users in Norway. We have around 99% uh, 
coverage population in Norway. We will increase that to 99.8 during a couple of months. Even at Svalbard, we have built out excellent mobile connectivity and fiber connectivity. With this connectivity that is very, very good, it gives opportunity for more innovation. And what is next? One of the next big things is that we connect everything to internet via sensors. And Norway is number three in the world on the front runner technology to internet of things, that is machine to machine communication. So we have already started to use the technology. To get a head start in Norway, Telnor has started an initiative to give access to our network, to get into a community of others that are connecting Internet of Things to Internet. We are providing uh, these initiatives in five different cities in Norway, including Tromsø and Long Airbnb. So there are very, very good opportunities also here in the Arctic region for connecting things to the Internet. We have already 70 users in Tromsø. And one of the initiatives we are doing is that we have put up sensors on the buses to measure air quality, and we collect, of course, that data, and then you can take action. In uh, Svalbard, we are measuring uh, the depth of the snow and also to de detect avalanche and give people warnings. So there are much more opportunities in this space. The other things we are doing is about mobility analytics. We are taking out aggregate data from the mobile network. We can say which countries people are coming from, where they are moving, and how quickly they are moving around. Of course, we are anonymous the data, so don't be worried. The tourist industry and the tourist agents, they, of course, would like to have access to these data. What we are doing here in Tromsø is to team up with the Winter Tromsø and then test out the technology. What we are doing is that we can say from which country are the tourists coming. We see that the Russian people, they would like to go ice fishing where they are here, while the pe people from Great Britain they will go downtown and take more the bars into use. So it's, it's different from each country you are coming from. And this, of course, is very, very important in terms of marketing of the different things we have here in Tromsø. We are also working up in the Lynx Alpene, both to promote tourism, but also to preserve nature, because we can track where people are moving around in these specific areas. So if you have ideas in this space, take the opportunity. There are so many opportunities in the technology space going forward and we can provide excellent connectivity. So you don't have to wait. If you have very good projects in mind, just keep in touch with us, and we sit down and discuss different opportunities going forward, because they are there. Great. Barrett, thank you. And, uh, Thanks for the national stereotype. I, of course, had to be dragged out of the bar to come onto this stage. And as <laughs> soon as we finish this panel, I'll be back in the bar. And you're welcome to join me for three or four pints over lunch. And then I'll stagger back here. And oh, Anyway, that's my day sorted. Um, <laughs> uh, OK, moving on. Uh, let me introduce you now to a, a woman who I'm delighted to say is in all sorts of lists of the most powerful women in Norway and Scandinavia and all over the world for her business acumen. Please give a, a warm wel welcome to Kristin Skogenlund, who is Director General of the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise. Kristin. Thank you so much. 
Well, I was here and I spoke at Arctic Frontiers two years ago, and then I spoke of the economic distress in the petroleum sector, with ongoing projects being terminated and plans put in the drawer. And I said that one should not underestimate the value of opportunity, nor underrate the potential that lies in this region's vast resources. And I don't think it was my words, but rather the opportunities that came along with currency rate and more free hands that gave a boost to tourism and to the mainland industries. Increased production in fisheries and the crab industry, as well as a fantastic profitability within salmon farming, have also buffered the fall in petroleum investments. And today, when the price of oil has doubled and offshore petroleum once again is very profitable, we need to reflect upon the importance of a diversified economy. We must make sure that the region's skills and competence in technology, services and operations do not bounce back. We have started the industrialization of fish farming. We have mineral resources ready for mining. We have seen a boost in tourism and a huge potential for a lot more visitors. Furthermore, improving the Norwegian-Russian relation could make way for utilization of the Barents Sea uh, and shipment to Asian market through the Northeast Passage. And for decades, Norway has provided the world with energy and energy-intensive products. This could and should continue as we move towards the hydrogen society with a continuously smaller climate footprint. And by 2050, our provision of daily fish meals to the world should increase tenfold to half a billion. And our biopharma can contribute to a more sound and healthy world population if we take full advantage of the aquaculture potential. And finally, whether we're talking about the ocean, oil, or minerals, as we've heard, digitalization is at the foundation of all future prospects. When we take our industrial endeavors to places that are deeper and darker and colder and more vulnerable than ever before, technology and digitalization will provide the tools for monitoring, controlling, surveying and collecting data, in addition to connecting people and things that we have already, already heard about. All this being said, we must uh, make sure that we make the most of the economic engine that is the petroleum sector to ensure the development of the Arctic communities. And I also said this two years ago, and I'll say it again, for this to happen, it is so incredibly important that we take care of the local skills and competence because we will not see thriving communities uh, if those who come here to the high north to work leave again as soon as the job is done. I firmly believe that if you have the infrastructure and you have the competence, anything is possible in this region. And uh, then I have one little finger for the authorities and it comes here. Uh, the authorities must make sure that they in incentivize and do not create hurdles for business development through endless long application procedures, unclear rights and unclear decisions, as we have seen some examples of, I could mention Nusir as one. We must assure that the new positive drive in the petroleum and in the other sectors brings along population growth, more and better education, roads, railways, flight connections and digital infrastructure to secure business innovation and tourism and the great prospects for local development and life improvement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, we've got two more speakers, ladies and gentlemen, and next up is uh, a man intimately involved with uh, the shipping industry, so that aspect of interconnectivity. Please give a very uh, warm welcome to Espen Paulsen, Chairman of the International Chamber of Shipping. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here in my capacity uh, representing the ICS, International Chamber of Shipping. For those of you who don't know, uh, we represent about 80% of the world fleet through 35 uh, national uh, ship owners associations and another 11 um, uh, associate members in specialized areas of the industry. 
Um, one of our many activities is to produce a wide range of guidance, publications, and industry best practice um, documents. And this includes a policy statement on shipping operations in the Arctic, uh, which has been shared with, amongst others, the Arctic Council. The ICS has developed, um, has, has heavily been engaged in the development at the International Maritime Organization, IMO, with the Polar Code, uh, which is a regulatory basis for shipping operations in the region as a supplement to the MARPOL Convention, uh, which provides mandatory anti-pollution measures for ship operations worldwide. The shipping in industry is fully aware of our responsibilities in maintaining the very, very high standards of safety and environmental protection. We fully recognize the special sensitivities surrounding the Arctic shipping, and we take these responsibilities very seriously in the Arctic and elsewhere we operate in the worldwide. The remoteness of the Arctic and its pristine nature presents conditions for ships that require specific provisions and safeguards that are embodied in the Polar Code, but which is also uh, worth noting that ships often and routinely operate in far worse conditions in the North Atlantic during the winter. We believe as ICS that there are really three main areas of opportunity for Arctic shipping. The first being vessels operating in the offshore exploration and extracting activity. And we've touched upon the fact that this is now somewhat reduced, partly due to the state of the market and energy, lower energy prices. And of course, will also be affected uh, on the assumption that we do decarbonize in line with the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Secondly, what we call point-to-point -point destination shipping, the transport of oil and gas exports plus raw materials such as iron ore, and as well as supplying the needs of the expanding uh, Arctic communities for the necessities or with the necessities required for a modern life. And thirdly, the area that probably gets the most attention in the media, which is the question of full transits between Asia and Europe via the Northern Sea Route over the top of Russia. But while the situation may change if the ice sheet continues to recede, the current significance of the northern route should probably not be exaggerated. Commercial transits do regularly take place, as you all know, during the summer months, uh, something which was probably impossible a number of years ago. And depending on the destination of the voyage between Asia and Europe, the, the uh, voyage time can be cut by almost half. But we're still talking about, in 2016, something like 19 transits, and I think last year about 40. And to put this in context, the passages through the Suez Canal during 2016, for example, was in excess of 50,000, 50,000 uh, passages. Moreover, the need to employ the services of very expensive Russian icebreakers, and actually it's been pointed out to me also, Finnish icebreakers um, that operate um, uh, with vessels uh, which are in any event um, designed for slower speeds and with ice class uh, features in mind means that the Northern Sea Route is probably only viable for ships trading to ports north of Shanghai. This may be, this may also, of course all change in the future, but the main focus of the industry is primarily increased destination shipping and any possible expansion of support vessel activity servicing offshore energy installations. Let me conclude by with some thoughts uh, about the regulations shipping needs to ensure a strong environmental uh, protection. As I mentioned, through the IMO, we already enjoy a comprehensive global regulatory framework that applies throughout the Arctic region. The new Polar Code, which has been in force for about one year, delivers a further level of confidence using a risk-based approach that addresses hazards relevant to the type of ship operation, the ship's location, and the season of operation. The MARPOL Convention for Pollution Prevention, which acts as a kind of umbrella to the IMO Polar Code, has been ratified by virtually every maritime nation as in enforced and is enforced across the entire world, supported by a sophisticated global system of port state inspections. This makes non-compliance exceedingly difficult, especially in the waters of the Arctic coastal states, which have been very, very robust in the enforcement systems. This includes Russia, which belongs to both the North Atlantic and Asia-Pacific port state control regimes, whose member nations in these regions share very detailed information about every individual ship employing sophisticated and coordinated targeting systems. 
However, despite our very, very best efforts, we must always be prepared for the unfortunate possibility of an accident or pollution incident. The biggest challenge uh, is of how to provide suitable coverage for search and rescue, and if ever needed, the necessary oil pollution response capability. This is beyond the scope of my remarks today, but I understand it is currently a high priority for the Arctic Council, where the ICS works at providing comprehensive expert advice through the PAME working groups, that is protection of the Arctic environment, marine, of the Arctic marine environment, which is a subgroup of the um, Arctic Council. In the meantime, we are pleased that the members of the Arctic Council, which are also, of course, IMO members, continue to pursue their goals via the very successful regulatory framework provided by IMO so that together we can make the full implementation of the Polar Code a success of which we can all be proud. That's and good. I would just finish mm. on saying that whilst the argument on free trade and globalization is um, alive and kicking, I would uh, argue that shipping's contribution to free trade and globalization uh, has been tremendous and is maybe not always recognized, but it's definitely there. Thank you very much. Good, okay. Thank you, Espen. Uh, our last uh, contributor before we get to our panel discussion is Rune Rafaelsen, who is mayor of Sovaranga uh, here in Norway. And uh, Rune, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I will say that I'm very impressed uh, by this Arctic frontier. I was sitting in the steering committee for eight years and it's fantastic to be here also as a speaker. So this has become a very important uh, event uh, every year. Uh, as you see that uh, I'm starting with a map. Uh, and as a mayor in, uh, in Kirkenes, uh, we always look at China first. Uh, in spite that we also have bordering uh, now with Russia. But because of the climate change, the Arctic will play a new and important role regarding new pattern for world trade. The Northern Sea Route and a high-speed data cable from Asia to Europe will open new possibilities for the Arctic. The cable will uh, connect three continents and 85% of the world's population and will end up in Kirkenes. This is not my world, this is uh, from, a, from a Finnish company called Sainia. Uh, one of our new partners in the Arctic is China. China will soon be the world's biggest economy, and that will create challenges and opportunities regarding uh, connectivity in the Arctic. Uh, last year, it was released a book uh, by a man called Peter Frankopan, a, a, a researcher from, from Oxford. It's called The New Silk Road, A New History of the World. I quote from the conclusion. In many ways, the late 20th and early 21st centuries have represented something of a disaster for the United States and Europe as they have played out their doomed struggle to retain their position in the vital territories that link East and West. The immense resources being plowed into the One Belt, One Road vision set out by Xi Jinping in 2013 strongly suggest that China is planning for the future. That's why the initiative from uh, Finnish Minister of Transport uh, and Communication on the banner in May 2017 or wish to take a closer look at the possibility of building a 500 kilometers railway from Rovaniemi to Kirkenes must be seen in this context. Xi Jinping, one month later, launched a maritime strategy with, with uh, China's Belt and Road strategy, which including the Northern Sea Route. The initiative was endorsed in October last year by the Norwegian Minister of Transport and Communication, Kjetil Solvik Olsen, who instructed the Norwegian National Railway Administration to work on this in cooperation with the Finnish Transport Agency. Through the existing regional follow-up initiative, we wish to highlight the good potential for the Arctic Railway, both currently and in the time perspective to 2040, when, which is the scope for the construction uh, of this railway project. The perspective is, of course, local, but also regional and international and considers the most relevant development related to international trade and logistic, as well uh, as environmental perspective, climate change and political condition. Compared uh, 
to the current traffic uh, through the Suez Channel, as was mentioned before, uh, before the Northern Sea Route uh, represents a significant reduction of the sailing distance between Southeast Asia and Europe. This route will be particularly favorable uh, between the northern part of Europe and the Asian countries like China, South Korea and Japan. For example, under favorable uh, navigational conditions, the Northern Sea Route, the sailing limit uh, time uh, for general cargo ships sailing from Yokohama in Japan to Hamburg in Germany can be cut from 34 to 23 days. Compared with navigation via Suez route, Reducing the sailing distance by 40% can reduce the fuel consumption by 20%. Uh, with the continuous and efficient rail link from Kirkenes to Germany via Helsinki and Tallinn, the three Baltic countries and Poland uh, train could complete the journey in just 24 hours. By comparison, the distance from Kirkenes to Hamburg by ship would require around four and a half days to complete the journey. The vision for the Arctic Railway offers an environmentally friendly and faster transport alternative of, for goods between Northeast Asia and Northern Europe via Finland by utilization of the Northern Sea Route and development of Kirkenes as a hub port, which we are actually now planning, uh, also preparing for railway. And uh, Mr. Solvik also has South been seeing the, that plan and also visited the, 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 the area. Uh, the rail uh, vision is based on the shortest travel time for containers from China to Northern Europe, and that the port of Kirkenes would be the triggering factor for a railway in line in, in a 2040 perspective. The route has the potential to be the new maritime silk route in the north. As the first western port uh, on the route, Kirkenes would be a strategic hub in the north for a liner traffic transporting containers to and from Asia. As the first western port in the north with a railway link, Finland and Norway would experience major employment effects in addition to a wider economic effects for our two countries. This is also good for, uh, for the booming tourist industry that we see from Asia, both in the northern part of Finland, also here in Tromsø and in the Maori region in, in Kirkenes. And we will also see a growing export uh, uh, of, of Norwegian seafood. So uh, the vision of an Arctic railway is uh, very, very important for the future of the Arctic. Okay. Um, don't go, Rune. We, we'll, you might as well stay here. We're going to call up all of our speakers now to join us on, on a panel discussion. So uh, let, I don't quite know if we have a seating order, but panel, uh, speakers, if you all join us up here on the stage, we'll get our panel discussion going. Um, So before lunch, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to chew over some of these connectivity and infrastructure issues with our panel. We've already heard their presentations. Now let's quiz them a little bit. Um, I'll begin. Uh, it seems to me there are two elements, or at least two elements, to what we've been hearing about. One is the degree to which uh, transportation routes can be opened up through this region, which will radically change and, and reform and improve connections between, for example, Asia and Europe. And Runa, your map was very useful, giving us a sense of just how big a deal that is. So that, that would be the Arctic as a sort of transit route, more than anything else. But then there's another part of our discussion, which is about investing in the, in the connectivity within the Arctic for the people of the Arctic, rather than just seeing it as a transit route, seeing it for itself and wanting to invest in the connectivity in itself. So let's start with that latter point first. My question to all of you, and let, maybe we can start with the ministers, whoever would like to answer this. Why should your general populations, taxpayers, have to pour so much money into connectivity initiatives in the Arctic, which serve so relatively few of your people? You know, in terms of investment per capita, pouring money into connectivity in the north isn't really very cost efficient. You could argue it's actually against the interests of your people as a whole. Well, I do not, uh, I do not agree that it's not in the interest of our populations. It's definitely in the interest of our populations because, as I stated, that if we have this very well connectivity, it's the possibility of also doing businesses locally and not just uh, seeing that, uh, that we are scarce all, all around. So it's, it's yeah, a good a, investment. As a, as, a, as a share of Denmark's mm. GDP, 
How much of your GDP is generated in the, in the far north? Well, when you look at the map, Denmark does not, I mean, when you see Denmark as a country, but when you see the Kingdom of Denmark, yeah, including with Greenland, Greenland yeah, exactly, yeah. with Greenland yeah. and with the Ferry Islands, that's, uh, that's a huge investment, no doubt about that, and, and we're not there yet, but we need to make these kind of investments, and that's why I was giving the example with the, with the Tele Greenland, to actually connect uh, people and also making the right environment for businesses to, to establish. I think we have great examples of that in Norway, where the connectivity is uh, still better, I have to admit, uh, better. When you have small businesses being based, for instance, north of Bergen in, in Vik, I, I heard of the, uh, of the high soft <coughs> business, which is, I mean, Vik is, uh, as I know, is, is a very tiny city, one road in, one road out. Mm. And if that road is closed, you, you're just there. Well, but the, the you have a huge and, uh, business there. Yeah. And it's very popular but, because but, you have good connectivity. But the same, all right, but the same point applies to Norway as to Denmark. I mean, 90% of your people do not live in, in the Arctic, the high north, and yet you're asking them to front up their taxpayer money to disproportionately invest in infrastructure, technology, investment, in the north. I mean, why, why would they? Why would they want to do that? Because I don't think you should look at this as one person making the same value from production no matter where they live. And when you see that there are a lot of natural resources that you can develop, but you need the infrastructure both to make it attractive for people to live and work here, but you also need to have the, the, the roots to get the goods out to the world. We have immense amount of gas and, and oil that in itself is, it, it doesn't necessarily employ a lot of people, but it creates a lot of value. That's why it's worth investing in this region, even though you don't have the whole population living here. But then when you see at the fisheries, it's uh, the 2017 was the greatest year for Norwegian fish exports. You see tourism growing because um, maybe because you don't have the whole population living up north, mm. meaning there are more unexplored territories. It's, it's more uh, wild, uh, wild uh, wilderness to, to, to look at. Mm. You have the, uh, uh, the, the winter uh, with, the, uh, with the great lights on the, on the, on the uh, sky, and then you have the summer with, uh, with sun all, all day and all night. And therefore, you, don't, you, don't have you, you should not approach this looking at how many people live here What's the amount uh, compared with the population? You should see what, what's the value we, we can create. How can we make this accessible? And therefore, the physical infrastructure, we need to build that out. And mm. when you kind of challenge Denmark, I don't think Denmark is going to, uh, you know, we have to do our cost in Norway. But we have a common uh, commitment, I think, in developing the Nordic region because I think Denmark and Finland will benefit from some of the tourism that may become because of the Northern Lights, but when they are in, Nor in the Nordic countries, they may go to see Santa does live in Norway, but you pretend he lives <laughs> in Finland. Uh, you know, they, they will he fly through Greenland. Copenhagen, Kastrup, and can spend a few <laughs> days there. Yeah. And, and I think we have to create... I, I don't want Arctic Frontiers to end with a, a fight about where Santa <laughs> lives. That, that, that would not be I a good look. I promise I won't go into that. Try and that. conclude then. <laughs> we'll we do will. that outside we'll afterwards. We'll do it outside. But, <laughs> but, but, but again, you know, it's also something about being Nordic. Of course, I'm, I'm really proud of coming from where I come from and from being Norwegian, but again, looking at the global scale, the Nordic has a special ring to it. And if we cooperate in developing this region, mm. developing the resources by doing it more environmentally friendly than anybody else, yeah. more connected than anyone else, you know, like Berit said, <laughs> We have really great cell phone coverage in Norway, and you wouldn't really believe that when you see how, how little or few people sure. living in the area. And, no, and it amazes me. We have rubbish cell phone coverage in parts of the UK see, where loads of people live, and you guys are obsessed with getting from 99.7% coverage to 99.8%. And see, and we have great pubs, so the British <laughs> should come here and live. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, our ambition is that Exploiting the, the resources in an environmentally and sustainable way, but also make this an attractive okay, well, place stop, to stop, stop for people to live. Because, you know, uh, 
we, I don't want to get into a whole fossil fuel debate again. We did a good session on that earlier. But, but are you really telling me that as part of this discussion about smart use of smart growth, um, 21st century growth, that, that uh, petroleum and oil and gas is a key pillar of smart growth for the high north in the 21st century? I'm not saying that the only foot you should stand on. But I also mentioned tourism, I mentioned fisheries, and I think they are probably more into the future than oil and gases, but oil and gas is also a driving force. Right, you see, Kristen did feature petroleum a lot in her presentation, and I was a bit surprised by that. You know, she but comes here to a, a, a session which is all about technology, 21st century smart growth, and Kristen, you spent half your time telling us about the importance of oil. Well, it is because it is such an important sector, and a lot of the new future technologies will come from within that sector, because that's where you have a lot of the competence. For example, the whole hydrogen evolution, you know, a lot of that competence will be found within petroleum today. And yeah, but we're supposed to be moving by 2050 to a zero yes, carbon world. Yes, I mean but first of all, it's a huge an important platform for any other economic development, infrastructure, education, all of these things we're talking about. That's number one. But number two is that you also have to, let's say, re-engineer uh, that sector itself. And that will happen from within that sector. And you have to take that into account as well. So I believe it is very important and we need to be able to have both those thoughts in our heads at the same time. Mm. All right. Um I was very struck by Telenor and its commitment to reaching every individual across the high north. Uh, is that really the best use of your resources, your technical skills, your capacities? Because in the end, don't you have to just say to some communities and some people in the remotest parts of this region, you know what, you, get, you want to live here and many of you are indigenous peoples for whom Life here is, is part of your identity, but we can't offer you just the same connectivity that we can offer to people in hipster bars in downtown Oslo. <laughs> now, of course, uh, it's always a question about uh, profitability when you are building out. And uh, Telenor is operating 12 different countries, so we are competing with uh, with funds to invest more in Norway. That, that's what we are doing all the time. And you can't afford to be too inefficient. I mean, using that word, you know, it, it, trying not to sound too pejorative about it, but if, if, you know, if you're over-investing in some of the more difficult-to-reach parts of your high north, that's affecting your competitiveness in other markets you want to be in, because you're having to cross-subsidize in a way. Yeah, but you know, people from Norway, they are traveling everywhere. So if there are good coverage in Oslo, people from Norway and from other cities are traveling up in the mountains during uh, weekends. And if the coverage is bad there, then we get a message immediately. They are traveling around for holiday, you know, and businesses are located up in the north. People from the north are going to the south. It's always people traveling around, and they are telling us it's bad coverage. So if we don't have good enough coverage everywhere, um, people are really angry. Mm. They expect it, but the good thing is they are willing to pay for it. They pay for good coverage. Mm. So it makes it profitable. And we are looking more at the users than different base stations because, of course, there are some base stations that are located out in, in um, remote areas that are not profitable to upgrade. Mm. But mm. because there are users there that are very important customers for us. We upgrade everything. Well, I, I wish Telenor had a bigger presence in the UK. You sound fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you might improve my, my internet signal. No, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I, thank you. That, so we're addressing two things. We're addressing the, the commitment to connectivity inside the Arctic region, but we're also, with you two, particularly at this end of the panel, we're considering the Arctic's potential as a, as a sort of uh, opening up of a new global, globally important route. But it strikes me that you two are in competition in a way. You have been re representing the shipping industry and you, Runa, are really excited about rail because of your geographical position. Which is going to be more important? If one looks at the t span of the 21st century and the opening up of the Arctic region, I would imagine shipping has more potential than rail in the end to be an exciting transportation sort of future for the Arctic? 
Rail wants to speak first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a combination, of course. Uh, if you look at uh, the world's biggest uh, container harbor, seven of them are in China. And if 10% of this container will go through the Northern Sea Route, this is for the shipping. I mean, mm. this, is, this is the future. This will come. Yeah. But, but uh, then you need a railway to, to, uh, to get it to, uh, to Europe, because uh, still Europe is China's most important trade partner. Right. And somewhere you have to take it in. And then this, uh, this uh, to, to take it through the Northern Sea Route and, and end up in, in, in the Barents Sea, and then took it to, to, to Helsinki, the tunnel to Tallinn, and then to... So to Kirkenes, Hull. for you, is, is the crucial sort of hub where you... He lives in Singapore. Do you? I do. Yeah. Well, what the heck and are you Chilken, doing here? Kirkenes is the new Singapore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 very, I'm very modest. Uh, well... Uh, that is a, I was in Singapore recently, so I'm trying to get my head around yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. walking around Kirkenes in my shorts. Yeah, good bars, and, uh, good bars. Yeah. Good bars, yeah, yeah. No, no chewing gum on your pavement. <laughs> um, but this is a serious point. You know, okay, so paint me your picture. You're an ambitious man. Yes. Uh, and you're a relatively young man looking at you. Yeah. So, that's so, true, that's true. Yes, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, paint me a picture of what Kirkenes is going to look like in, in 30 years' time. Uh, it will be uh, 20,000 people there, it will double. And well, that's not Singapore, is it? That's no, no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just warming up. Uh, 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 <laughs> so, so uh, uh, last week, uh, I was together with my colleague, the mayor of, of, of uh, Rovaniemi, Esko Lottonen, and we presented this project uh, by a film uh, called Arctic Corridor for mm -hmm. the Chinese. And uh, they, they were very interested, and, and uh, this was, will be followed up. We are helping Minister Sulvik Olsen and Banner to promote this project. Uh, with the Chinese, so, so I think this is uh, uh, something that we will see more and more. And of course, uh, uh, while the ice is, uh, is, uh, is uh, I think, 2030, there might be no ice, uh, some say that, they, there will be an alternative to do this. And also the cable that I mentioned, that you could have a cable from, uh, from Asia through the Bering Sea, so you connect three continents and 85% of the world population in the Arctic, through the Arctic hub, this is also a, the, 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 this this is is a fantastic connectivity. Is it, yeah, is it? I mean, you're, you're hopping about with excitement, but is it really good for the Arctic to become... I think so. Yes. I have lived all my life in the Arctic. I, I grew up in a mining town mm. with open pit mining. I mean, this is maybe the most uh, uh, destroyed municipality in all of Norway, but I had a good life, and mining is, uh, is, uh, is okay. And uh, by the moment, it's, it's down, but it will come up. So I think the minerals, uh, the fishery... Uh, the Arctic is, uh, is prepared, I think, for, right. for, for more I mean, we don't, we don't have any out-and-out -out sort of environmentalists on this panel. We've got plenty of them on other panels. But if we had one, I suspect they might be getting a bit worried by... You know, we're supposed to be talking about the smart future of the Arctic, and we're now getting back to talking about railways, mining, oil. You know, maybe I'm missing something, but it doesn't sound incredibly smart and futuristic to me, it sounds... I, I thought railway was very bad, uh, rental, that uh, yeah, right. railway is it's a good way to transport. Yes, Espen... Okay, yeah, I mean, I think we have to put things in context here, because first of all, containers, let's say, by rail, let's say 500 containers, mm. that takes uh, however many cars, three, two, 300 cars. Yes. A 22,000 TEU container ship, which is the biggest currently in existence, uh, if you were to put that on railway cars, it would be sort of five kilometers or ten kilometers. I don't know the figure, but it mm. would be massive. So I, I think... We, but we is he realistic when he talks about this exponential growth? You said, in a moment of realism, you said, but let's look at the actual figures. The no number of passages coming through the Arctic Corridor compared with the Suez Canal, it was, what, something like 40 against 50,000. So, so when we're talking about Kirkenes as the new Singapore, maybe we're just getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Well, it, it, it won't be in my lifetime, that's for sure. But, right. um, but uh, I, I mean, I think um, I, I understand what the Kirkenes is trying to do, but I, I just think that ships uh, going through the, the Northeast Passage will, will be, continue to be limited. It will almost certainly continue to be in the summer months. The polar code is there, and it's very strict, thankfully, and it will ensure that ships that are equipped to do the job will do the job, but what I'm saying is that mm. si size, if you take a 22,000 TU container ship, it's never going to go through that passage. It's just not going to happen. If you take a 300,000 dead weight super tanker, it's never going to go that route. It's going right. to go around the Cape. I mean, that's, that's a reality. So there may be some incremental growth, but it, I, I just don't see it's going to be on the scale that, that maybe um, the mayor is talking about. 
Uh, Anna, I haven't heard you contribute to this, but Finland's obviously key to this particular discussion, and you apparently are talking to lots of Chinese investors and all <laughs> sorts of people. How, how confident are you of, of this new growth that, that everybody else seems to be contemplating? I think every sector in the future will be depending on f access to fast data. We have all sectors, all, gr all, everyone will be growing based on digitalization, which will also actually in remotely inhabited areas provide services on a different value creation uh, base than what we see in previous developments. What, what do you mean by that? I mean by that that we need to enhance digital services, we need to enhance access to data, and by that, for instance, in Arctic areas, we can have access to research, we can have access to areas which we haven't had access before. So connectivity is something that we as society need to grant. That is also a promise that we give to our people, that there is access everywhere, and that we are able to create a benefit in the areas which are also remotely inhabited. And today we can do it much more efficiently by using digitalization and data. And we also see that the need to transmit data between Asia and Europe will grow about 200% by year up in the next five years. The data cable project connecting the Asian countries, China, Japan, Russia, then through Norway, Finland, going down to, to Central Europe, will create not only a transit area for the northern areas, but it will create a, a great opportunity for investment. Data centers will localize in the northern parts because it's more efficient. The data cable access will provide more investments in the northern areas. So I don't see this as something that's a transition. It is something that will become natural. Then again, when we look in Finland at the Arctic Rail, we are not so much looking at the Northeast Passage or the shipping capacities. We are much more looking at what can we do to connect the northern parts of Europe to the central Europe? How can we connect the Arctic areas that we are so proud of uh, towards the European thinking? How can we make an interesting way to get from Berlin to some place north in Norway? How can we support our tourism? Mm. How can we create more local um, energies? How can we create more local businesses? And for that, I think uh, we are looking at this as a, as a total picture. We are looking how will we create the areas where the large populations are in Central Europe? How can we connect those through Helsinki up to the northern areas in the Arctic? And how can we also make goods traveling that same way? They don't necessarily have to arrive by ship first. And I think we already have to be ambitious by ourselves and create also a European thinking from continent to our northern parts. And this has been very much missing in the European discussions. Our 10T core network is stopping very low. We haven't been integrating our natural part of northern Europe into Europe. And I think it's time to do so. Uh, and <laughs> what? I just wonder, underpinning a lot of what everybody on this panel is saying about, you know, your high confidence that connectivity, the digital world is going to be very good for the Arctic region and that the, the in, transport infrastructure is going to radically improve and essentially this notion that the region was somehow remote and isolated is gone forever. Yes. The, does that bring with it a strategic sense that more and more of your people will live not just be connected, but will live in the high north. Is that part of the strategic vision in the Nordic countries? I hope so also, because as uh, Ketil here mentioned, we have a lot of natural resources in these areas. And in order to get those resources also to be utilized and to create value, we need to make these places attractive for living, studying. And I think Tromsø is a fantastic example of a city with a wonderfully uh, enlarged university mm. with, uh, with a growing potential in an area which is very, very high up north. Mm. And I think um, you maybe want to continue on that. 
Either of you two, yeah? Well, uh, building the physical infrastructure with roads, uh, railroads, uh, airports and stuff, that's, that's dealing with reducing transaction costs, both for businesses but also for families. If, if you want this to be an attractive, if you want anywhere to be attractive, you, you need to have a family be able to, to all feel that they can fulfill their lives. Mm. You know, kids need good schools and, and, and activities. Both the husband and wife needs a, a job that's challenging and, and satisfying. You can't just rely on one family moving because one of the caretakers have a job. And, you know, check into any hotel room. If you don't have Wi-Fi access, you start swearing. Mm. Well, what do you think it's going to be like living somewhere if you don't have the access? It's not going to be a trash. You should try parts of London. <laughs> well, that's why we live in Norway, isn't it? No, but, but you know, kidding aside, if we, want, if we want any qualified person to live anywhere where you can uh, live off tourism uh, resources or anything, you need to make sure that they're connected. If not, you're going to lose out. You can have as much oil and gas as you want, mm -hmm. but if the, fa if, if the person going to run the facilities cannot communicate with his family or with his company on Skype or FaceTime or whatever, he's going to have second thoughts and he's going to want to live somewhere else. So if, if you want to have high qualified people live anywhere, you need to have everything connected. And that's why, that's why we're, you know, it's important for me as a minister that Telenor and the competitors actually go as close to 100% coverage as possible. Finmark just you mean you're angry with her that she's only at 98.9? No, no. <laughs> you know, gonna... we, we are um, among the best in the world when it comes to 4G connection, when it comes to, to high-speed uh, uh, fiber. Yeah. And, and Finnmark, which is the northernmost uh, county, just four years ago, you had 7% of the, of the uh, inhabitants having uh, high-speed uh, internet. Today, it's 82% and it's growing. Yeah. That's increasing the attractiveness of the region really fast. And you know, the, the idea is that you should live anywhere in Norway and you, sh you shouldn't think about, you know, it's, it, it could be for a year, it could be for a lifetime, but you are supposed to feel that you're a part of the full society, you have the same access to government services, to healthcare and everything. That has to deal with quality of life and I think as long as you f uh, find those basic needs uh, Matt. Oh, uh, Kristin, I, I just want to bring you back in as you speak really on behalf of Norwegian business, I guess. I mean, uh, is there a, a, a real mindset shift in Norway that actually because of the connectivity improvements that are being made and the ambitious future that's being painted, more and more business people are, are, are looking at the North as a, a potential investment sort of site? Yes, and also the fact that the, the, you know, the incredible potential that's here in terms of the resources, everything, you know, that's becoming, or the awareness of that is very much on the rise. And I have to say that, you know, when you pose your questions, you are, you know, alluding a little bit to that this, del this development will somehow destroy the Arctic. But I think mm. you can't approach environmental challenges and other things by trying to avoid things because people will demand energy, they will demand transportation, and the only thing you can do is to solve it. And business are the ones who will have to solve these things. And actually, by developing the Arctic, I think you'll have a massive incentive to really come up with new solutions in order to do this in a yeah, sustainable way. Yeah, but I mean, the, you know, the record of the 20th century doesn't tell us that business is, is always in the that's, business of coming up not, with solutions. That's it's not really true. Often I mean, it's short-term no, fixes, which are long-term problems. That's changing. And you actually mm -hmm. see now a decoupling between, you know, from economic growth and emissions. You know, that curve has shifted. Mm -hmm. And it is because you have a completely, you know, changed attitude and awareness in business. You know, it, it has become business to solve the climate issue. You know, it, they're making business out of solving it, and mm. that's the only way you're going to deal with it. All right. So uh, I really believe uh, that. You panelists, have, if you want a quick word, do, and then I'm going to open it up to our audience. So Just very briefly stating that I totally agree with the necessity of the connectivity and also creating the incentives for families, for, for young people to actually to, to stay. But I think what is very important, a very important message as well, is that the environmental pressure is not coming from the Arctic, but it's actually happening from the outside. So you need to have partners in this development. You mm. need to, to have um, you know, other stakeholders actually paying interest to the development of the region. So it's just important that we have this, this kind of uh, cooperation and, mm. and that we actually need this kind of uh, circumpolar sharing. 
okay. as well. And, and, and just to support what Christine is saying, because it's the cooperation between government and private investors where we have to make sure that we have good ground rules taking care of the sustainability of the, the environment. And we see that, you know, you kind of question oil and gas, is that the way of developing? Well, it's not the only way, but that's going to be a driving force for a few decades still. And that's going to put the, or, or pave the way for for uh, all the connectivity investments that we're going to have, it's, it's going to more than uh, defend the investments. Mm. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we see that or show that we can uh, exploit the, uh, the minerals, the oil and gas resources in a sustainable way without kind of making everything black around it. Uh, and I, and I, when I look at the Norwegian oil and gas industry, when I look at the Norwegian transportation industry, the mineral industry, they do have a completely different mindset now, just compared with about 10 years ago, I, I would say. And I think they were pretty good 10 years ago, mm. but it's, it's more integrated in all the way of thinking. And it, I, it has to deal with all of society now expects clean water, clean air. You don't allow for economic development if it ruins everything else that makes uh, or gives you life quality. Well, good. I mean, nobody's going to quarrel with that as long as you follow through on it. Yeah, but, and, 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 and uh, yes, we are, because even though we want to, to develop the oil and gas industry in, in the north, we're still going to keep up the electricity approach when it comes to the transportation sector. Mm. So our, even our transportation policies means that in some decades, pretty much everything is going to be run on electricity, not on oil and gas. Yes, so, it, it, so that's kind of... Sure, but you're not producing oil and gas just for yourselves. You're producing it into a world market. Exactly, and, yeah. and that's why we have, as a, as a Nordic society, show that this is the next step on how the world is going to be organized and work. Oh, if but only the world always followed the Scandinavian model, we might all be in a better place. And I, and, and it, I it can, doesn't. So. And I, and I can't uh, can force anyone, but I think that we still need to produce the oil and gas because other people are going to consume it. But we also can show that having electri electric cars as the foundation for transportation mm. is going to work, but of course it's going to require a lot of investment in other places. And you're also always going to have this transition period, and it's going to be different in different countries. Yeah. And again here, I think the Nordic countries can kind of try to show the way without cutting off oil and gas investments immediately. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open it up because I want to get as many questions in as I can. I've got lots in the middle section over here and one over there. Uh, all right, that lady's so keen, she's literally jumping in the air with excitement. So you can have the first one, ma'am. Go on. Uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful, interesting and informative speeches. Uh, it was really nice to hear you. And I have a question to Mr. Paulson, because uh, my scientific interest in, uh, is in navigation uh, in polar waters. Uh, I'm studying international law, and you've mentioned polar cord several times in your speech. And I would like to ask, uh, despite the fact that it was adopted a year ago, uh, there is uh, less law practice based on it. And I would like uh, to ask you why it is so. It is the first question. And second, uh, why, uh, what do you think about the contradictions of it? Uh, first, for example, that uh, it is uh, not all the vessels are covered uh, in the polar cord. And then uh, uh, there is uh, like a ratio of recommendatory provisions of polar cord with other sources of law, uh, in, of international law. And uh, could you please comment on this? Thank you. Okay, so it's all about the polar code. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't quite hear the first, uh, the first part of your, uh, your question, but I, 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 would just, I would say that the polar code is, is an achievement uh, of which all, the, all concerned, not least the Arctic Council, should be, should be very proud. I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not suggesting that it's perfect, but from the feedback and every, all the information I've seen, uh, it is working uh, very well. The enforcement is is pretty consistent. The problem with all these conventions is always the enforcement. Enforcement can be very inconsistent. And if it's very heavy in one place and not in another, then of course it leads to, it leads to uh, complaints and dissatisfaction uh, with, with the tenor of it. But, but, but overall, I have heard the, uh, myself with, nothing but about There are contradictions within it, apparently. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I've mentioned some of them. Because uh, first of all, Polo Court doesn't cover uh, all the vessels. Uh, which are managing in polar waters. And secondly, there is a ratio uh, of recommendatory provisions of polar court with another uh, legal sources. 
I think we have to take this afterwards because it's it's detailed and uh, it is detailed. You know, and, uh, uh, right, but, but I, I hope you will because it, it's, I will. A, it's yeah. an important question. So uh, we'll absolutely okay. Thank call you. him Thank afterwards. You. Don't let Thanks. him escape. Okay, I, let's I will not escape. I promise. <laughs> let's take a couple. Uh, there's a, uh, a gentleman in the there and a gentleman there. Uh, where's the microphone? There, there it is. So let's give it to this gentleman and then that gentleman. Yeah. So number one and then number two. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Brooks from Canada, representing the Canadian Coast Guard, and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Emergency Prevention and uh, Preparedness and Response Working Group of the Arctic Council. So I'd like to come back to Mr. Polson's comments with respect to the importance of the work ongoing in the Arctic Council Working Group for Protection of the Marine Environment. And uh, in fact, uh, Canada and Iceland right now are actively working to advance a project proposal that would link across the PAME working group, the EPPR working group, and also the Arctic Coast Guard Forum to study the question of low impact shipping corridors uh, across the circumpolar Arctic. Um, of course, this question and this work, it, connectivity and transportation are at the heart of it. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the work that we're doing as governments within this Arctic Council working group uh, and the Arctic Coast Guard Forums, how better can we approach your industry to start that conversation and loop you into that work? I'm wondering if you have any advice on how we could do that more effectively. Well, I mean, we and ICS are, are part of this uh, PAMI uh, work, work group, and, and our representatives are there. And, um, you know, we, we are fully in favor of all the open cooperation and communication we can have with Arctic Council and, and the subgroups. In fact, we would love to be an observer of the Arctic Council. We, we have asked to be, but, but many others want to do the same thing. So it hasn't happened yet, but we hope to. But um, I, I would say through the already le uh, excellent level of communication that we have uh, from our secretariat in London where, where specific individuals are charged with this particular, you know, with the liaison with this group. Um, so so more, more of the same, I would say. But shipping, I mean, uh, maximizing shipping and creating these important new routes, it, is, it has a negative effect on the environment. You'd accept that. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's are you doing have, enough to ameliorate well, that? We, we, I, I, I believe we are doing everything we, we can do within the IMO. The mm. IMO is a regulator. For those of you who don't know, the IMO, International Maritime Organization, is the United Nations agency based in London governing shipping and shipping regulation. And we as industry work very, very closely with IMO and we believe that global rules, global um, regulation is the only way to go via the IMO. Okay, well, we'll leave that and we'll get to this gentleman. So, thank yeah. you, Stephen, for your tough questions. And thank you to the panelists for your great answers. My name is Jack Whitaker. I'm a PhD student from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So when the storm recently hit Puerto Rico, a lot of the electricity went out because all the grid was connected. And then Elon Musk came in and started installing solar panels that were microgrids. So I was kind of wondering, I've heard of certain Danish island that was having renewable energy that was a microgrid, mm -hmm. but just likewise, uh, the micro islands of Indonesia, unlike the Silk Road, they were insulated from disease and crime, even colonization. So I was wondering, in the Arctic scheme of things, is there a move for sustainable microgrids yeah. and innovation? Thank Interesting you. question. We're banging on about connectivity and joining up the Arctic, but actually maybe there's something to be said for the notion of microgrids and not making everything interdependent to a point where there's actually vulnerability built into the interdependence. Well, yeah, I'm, well, I'm not a super expert on this, but I could, I mean, we are definitely seeing a, a trend towards decentralization of the electrical system and, and logic, and it creates great opportunities for, for exactly development in more remote areas. And I think what you, what you lack to, to fulfill it completely is that you, you need still some better storage and battery capacity because it will vary so much, you know, the, you know, the, the access you yeah. have to renewables. But, but it's definitely developing very, very quickly, and, and it, uh, it makes, you know, gives room for completely new logic mm -hmm. in, in uh, development of, of uh, that type of infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. 
quick, yeah. Anna. A quick point to that is that many of these innovations and developments, again, still need that there's a good access to data and that data can flow. So we still need all the time to work on connectivity in the mm. Arctic. Mm. Okay, I'm not going to let you speak because I want to get a couple more questions in at least. Uh, let's come to the front and then to the side. So if we get a microphone to the gentleman there, and you, you go first. Actually, I, I meant the gentleman there, him, yes. And then we'll come to you, but you first. Uh, thank you very much for your discussions. Uh, well, you were talking about connecting the Arctic, and there are many... Hold the mic close to your mouth. Yeah, yeah. there are many Arctics, but we didn't talk about Greenland, or Nunavut, or Alaska, or Russia which I think are the ones who need connectivity right. the most. And if connectivity implies resilient and um, development in an uh, economical way and social way, mm. I'd like to address to the Minister of Denmark, because uh, I need an explanation why Greenland has no uh, relation or access whatsoever to Nunavut or Canada, where uh, culture similarities are preeminent and um, and language too, and uh, the environment. Thank right. you. Right. Yeah. So, is there an answer to that? W why is Greenland not more connected up to? Because we're simply not there yet. I think it is extremely important to have this kind of connectivity, but we are not there yet. Because you uh, haven't prioritized it in the way that Norway has. You haven't prioritized it. Well, we we are trying to prioritize it, but. Actually, we do have huge challenges when it comes to the communication and connectivity in Greenland as this very, very huge island. And I mean, you know the exact same, um, same difficulties when you look, for, a, for instance, to the Canadian side. So, so we are not there yet. And that's a discussion, again, on the investments, who is actually willing to make this kind of connectivity. So for me, it's extremely important that we do this in a, in a collaboration and that we find the, the smart ways to do it. And, and that's, uh, we're, we're not there yet, but we are you know, in the corporation trying to find uh, investments and, and actually the, well, the base to do it. Okay, uh, I'll move on because I want to get more in. My name is Jarl Åbakke. I'm the deputy mayor of the municipality of Tromsø. So Welcome to all of you, and on behalf of the 75,272 people. <laughs> and uh, as you may know, uh, we are here from Finland, Sweden, northern part of, of the Arctic, and the demographics is my point. Um, uh, urbanization is taking place in the mm. Arctic, as mm. well as the rest of the world. And this city contributes a lot to the GDP, Solvikolsen. And one example, what costs 50 billion Norwegian, Norwegian kroners a kilogram? I can tell you it's an enzyme that is produced here and it's a part of the biotechnology revolution. So you don't have to talk about minerals and vast, the human resources, and they are now in urban areas. And so in Finland, it's Oulu and Rovaniemi in Sweden, it's Luleå, Umeå. In Norway, it's especially Bode and Tromsø. And the numbers are interesting. Since 1972, when the university was established in this city, mm. there has been an increase, 83%. In Bode, 60%. There uh, are population, you mean? Yeah, population. Yeah. Well, I said... Uh, you said almost correctly. So well, thank you for being correctly. polite. You mean I was I'm a bit wrong, but never mind. I'm polite, you're polite, you're a hard talker, I'm polite, <laughs> just polite. But, but uh, before you stop, I just want to ask you, because we, we've, we've talked a lot about this, about the degree to which people will move to the north. What's it's your vision? You must have a vision in Tromsø. Let's say by 2050, how many people do you believe will live in Tromsø? I can tell you, sir, I can't tell you that, because the recent numbers show that there are a big increase in the number of employees working in private enterprises in the north, in the big cities, but in the north. And there is not a similar increase in the people who move here and live here. And in contrast to the south where Ketil Solvik Olsen lives, there's the opposite development, less employment, more people. Right. So there are only 20,000 more North Norwegians than in 72, but there are 1 million more Norwegians living mostly in the South. And, Mr. Hartoker, you have a very good point. 
How will people in the South pay for that in the North? Yeah. And my experience, mm, I'm not so quite sure. Very interesting. Thank you. I, that's a great contribution. It's such a great contribution, you've made us out of time, unfortunately. Uh, but because I like to always give a golden ticket for a last point or question, does anybody feel so passionate they have to speak? as we close this session. You win, sir, because you put your hand up very quickly. But it's got to be really quick, because otherwise we're going to miss our lunch. So be very quick. Can we get the microphone to this gentleman? Uh, it's got to be the quickest question ever. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm a student from Brown University in the US. And I do want to ask you, besides being the beneficiary of the Northern Sea Route, uh, which was proposed by many uh, Nordic nations, what do you think of China's role in the infrastructure investment? For example, China proposed a new platform like Asia Infrastructure Bank, which can finance all the infrastructure, including potential airports, uh, ports, and other infrastructure you may need for the Northern Sea Route. OK, Chi China as a source of massive investment in the Arctic, how excited are you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've never... On a scale of one to ten, that's about two, I'd say. <laughs> no, uh, I, I would be open for any investments uh, as long as we cooperate on what to invest in. And uh, in expanding our infrastructure, you know, we have things happening with Finland. We have uh, things happening with Sweden. If the Chinese wants to be co-investing co in, in, in that, you know, I'd be happy to. Runa, you, you love the Chinese and you're very excited about... Yeah, they have started to invest in tourism in Finland, and uh, I think in cooperation with Norwegian company, they could be a good partner, like Russia is a good partner also in the north. Yes. I, th I think the whole Silk Road initiative presented by President Xi really shows the huge potential, and that kind of potential is, I mean, we need to have cooperation about it. It's, it's, it's how we develop, and I, I really, I mean, I see great potential in it when they talk about the Silk Road and, and going all the way over and having this kind of trade possibilities. I mean, it goes both ways. So, of course, we do have interest in that kind of yeah. cooperation. I think there's one belt, one road, or belt and road, as it's now called, is, mm. is obviously the priority for, for China at the moment. And, and it's massive, absolutely massive, yeah. and it's happening. So it may well be that, that um, China's involvement in the, in the Arctic will be secondary to this, uh, to this initiative. Mm. Okay. I, panel, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I do believe that uh, much as we love discussion, we also love lunch. So let's end this panel right there. I invite you to enjoy your lunch, but before you do, just give our panel a very warm thank you. Thank you very much, panel.